what happens to society when they fall into the web of American capitalism. What happens to the authentic development of those societies when American investments direct the economic growth? What happens to the class struggle in those societies when American policymakers, after all, buttress and fortify the ruling elite, or when they make deals and subordinate the Lumpen bourgeoisie of those particular societies? When they militarize the most repressive and reactionary regimes in the world, like the regime of Park in South Korea or the regime of the Shah in Iran? When those American policymakers trigger an ideological offensive under the banner of anti communism, which is directed against any and every movement of the left? And those are, of course, critical questions. And we have really seriously to probe for answers in the course of this semester if we are to understand in any way how it is that scores of millions of lives are blown about daily and hourly by the winds of imperialism. Now it is perfectly true that we can come to some kind of understanding of the scope and of the insistence of American expansionism if we simply confront the aggregate statistics about investments abroad and about the export trade, that we get some sense, after all, of that kind of insistent intrusion by American capitalism into the economies of those other societies, that we get some sense of the demeanor of American capitalism over the economic choices of those societies when we think about those figures, when we realize, for example, that in the first two post-war decades, that the value of American investments abroad increased by a sevenfold uh, rate. Uh, that in 1946, those investments totaled simply $7.2 billion. By 1966, you're talking about private American investments overseas of a staggering figure of $54.2 billion. Or when we realize, for example, that the volume of goods in American foreign trade, the volume of goods which American firms exported, tripled over a 15-year period from 1950 to 1965. A kind of process of bludgeoning the goods and commodities of the United States into foreign markets, which would become perfectly frenetic from the mid-1960s in the hands of American-based multinational corporations. And we can certainly sense something about the decisive intrusion of American policymakers into the politics of other societies and their dominion over the political choices of those societies when we confront those brute statistics on the shipment of arms around the world. When we realize, for example, that in the years between 1949 and 1966, that American policymakers placed at the disposal of selected client governments around the world, including the most repressive regimes imaginable, a staggering total of $31 billion worth of hardware, that that military equipment, after all, and think about it carefully, that that military equipment dug a tremendous chasm between the repressive capacity and power of the establishment in those societies and the capacity of the popular classes ever to resist that power. That what it did, after all, was virtually to moot the revolutionary question. We really do have to think about whether we can root and ground our understanding of imperialism in aggregate statistics alone. We have to ask whether we can really see the people behind those numbers. Because it is literally true that if you simply and only quantify a problem, you tend, after all, to trivialize it and to dull the cutting edge of your commitment, which we know is precisely the ploy, that kind of detached neutralism of establishment social science.
But let's face it very squarely, that there is a very real connection between sensibility and knowledge. And the point is that we can never come to terms with the substantive reality of imperialism simply by reading it off a computer printout. That fundamentally it is essential to come close to this question, to analyze it in its specificity, so that we see how it works in concrete societies, so that the sweat and blood of the victims of imperialism begin to irrigate our consciousness. And it is precisely for that reason that we return one final hour to talk about the Greek people, because we are concerned to know how it was for their society under 30 years of the American era, how it was for those Greek people to live in the Truman Doctrine era after having mounted a revolutionary movement which almost, almost wrote another scenario for Greece. And in addressing those 30 years of Greek history, we really have to keep the American apologetics in mind. We have to remember that Mr. Truman, when he went before the Congress in March of 1947, drew a picture of a Manichaean universe divided between free peoples and slaves, and that he proposed as the only purpose for the American mission in Greece to to save it for the free world, so that it should be partner with such uh, outstanding models of renewed humanity as South Korea and the Philippines and Taiwan and Franco Spain. And we must remember also that 20 years after that, our own university played host to a symposium which was to celebrate and to laud the democratic and the economic miracle which had been wrought in Greece by the Truman Doctrine. And we must keep those factors in mind and those apologetics so that we have some understanding of how degenerate and how self-serving the political vocabulary of the establishment has become and how hypocritical its behavior. And if you ask the question, what has it meant for Greece to have lived these 30 years under the American Imperium? What has it meant for the Greek people that 25 and 30 years ago foreign imperialism intruded in order to abort its revolutionary process? If you ask those questions, then I would set out a working hypothesis, a working assumption that over the past 30 years, save for those two years between 1963 and 65, when there was a popular mobilization in Greece, save for those two years, that over 30 years, the dominant fact of Greek political life has been the counter-revolution that essentially, except for a six-year period between 1967 and 73, when a cabal of army officers established a naked military dictatorship over the Greek people, that except for those years, the ruling class of Greece has operated through a repressive parliamentary structure in order to elaborate and to perfect a counter-revolution that for most of those 30 years, right-wing ministries have been in command, which ministries have set no higher tasks than the threefold task of in the first place destroying the popular movement, secondly, preventing its resuscitation, and third, of creating that kind of repressive political framework within which neocolonialism could develop. And how do we explain it? How is it possible to have such staying power by the right in a country in which the popular classes had but so recently and so nearly set Greece off on another course? The most obvious and immediate answer turns on the capacity of that right to suppress the left.
the capacity of those right-wing governments to suppress a left which had been so buoyant in the 1940s. That what you're talking about is a right-wing government which manages to exploit the victory that it won in the Civil War, which manages to deploy the massive military support that it gets from the United States, and which builds those particular advantages into a kind of police state that operates incessantly and perpetually under the cover of a constitutional regime in, in Greece. The point is, you see, that for these 30 years, the left as an effective force has virtually disappeared from Greece. That the ruling class, that that power elite, has managed very effectively to strip the popular classes of their instruments of struggle. And that, after all, has its explanation. It begins with the very biological hole that is created by the resistance movement and by the civil war. That is, you are talking about a left whose cadre and whose ranks have been so badly decimated by those experiences, so that by the end of the civil war, there were literally scores of thousands of Greek militants who had either been killed or who were in prison or who had gone into exile, that you are talking about 25,000 political prisoners in 1949, that you are talking about 80,000 political exiles, and, how, and we hardly know how many killed in the process of that civil war. But you see, the successive right-wing governments, from the return of Tsar Daris in March of 1946, until the resignation of Konstantin Karamanis in uh, May of 1963, that successive right-wing governments didn't rest easily on the basis of that biological hole, but they went after the left, or anyone they thought was the left, with a tremendous vehemence. That their first target, of course, was the Communist Party, which had been the stronghold of the revolutionary movement, the spearhead behind the Popular Liberation Front, so that by the the law of the 27th of December of 1947, the Greek Communist Party was outlawed. And within two years, when the civil war was over, the leaders of that once burgeoning party picked up the shards of a shattered movement and went into exile. But that only gives us the tip of the iceberg. Because to have outlawed the Communist Party was by no means to have extirpated all of the evil that it presumably had done. And consequently, those right-wing ministries, ministries busied themselves with the technology of surveillance and control over a people whose popular classes, after all, had had the audacity to think about a democratic Greece and even to struggle collectively in order to reach it. And we're talking, of course, about the strong control by these repressive governments over the trade union movement. That trade union movement, which traditionally is the major instrument of struggle for an urban proletariat. Now we know that that urban proletariat in Greece had veered sharply to the left in the course of the resistance movement, and that by March of 1946, the General Confederation of Labor, the central syndicalist organization in Greece, had gone into communist hands. But then the government of Tsaldaris intervened and took a grip on it, ousted the communists, and put in their place a government-appointed leadership headed by the very strong arm, Focus Macris. And it was that Macris and his crew that for the next 30 years would ride herd on the Greek syndicalist and trade union movement, subsidized in the early years very heavily by the AFL-CIO, 
whose international gumshoes, Irving Brown and Jay Lovestone, were all over the map subsidizing and maneuvering the breakup of unions they considered to be revolutionary, that Greek trade union movement became a model of anti-communist, no-strike unionism and ran herd over any possible radicalism within its ranks so that it was perfectly easy uh, for the government in 1955 to reduce all collective bargaining to compulsory arbitration, to say that strikes were outlawed and that consequently any event, any labor dispute had to be arbitrated. And even more, it enabled the government to reactivate those most abominable laws of the Metaxas fascist period, like that law of 1939, which made it permissible for the government just to throw strikers in jail. But you see, to have suppressed free trade unionism isn't really half the story. Because the urban proletariat is small, and what these ministries looked for were blanket instruments, instruments to hit the mass of peasants, the mass of petty bourgeois. And consequently, they went off on attack in 1948 of really disciplining the popular classes of Greece by that most despicable of methods of threatening economic annihilation. I talk about the law of the 5th of June of 1948, which is a law that introduced the so-called Certificate of Good Citizenship, which, though considerably less barbaric than the past books that the South African government imposed upon Africans in 1952, had the same purpose of ousting from any economic viability or job those who were not safe in the society by its original terms. Uh, that law of June of 1948 had its limitations. It said that even though, after all, the bureaucracy was then honeycombed with pro-Nazis and with fascist metaxist types, that even though that was true, any candidate for a government job had to present a certificate of good citizenship proclaiming that he or she was not or had never been a communist. Fair enough. But then the law gets stretched out of all proportion and becomes a blanket instrument of control so that by 1950, that certificate of good citizenship has to be presented for any job in the private sector, even jobs in factories as unskilled workers. And more than that, that the test is no longer communism, but it is something called crypto-communism or communist sympathizing, which gives you, you see, all of those characteristic categories of witch hunting, uh, so that a ruling class and its minions can crack down even on the most benign critics of a particular a social system, nor does that distend the question of repression uh, to its limits. <coughs> Because Gramsci was a thousand times right, was he not, to have said that a ruling class ultimately anchors its dominion in its ideological power. That it uses, after all, of the power at its disposal of the informational and of the cultural institutions, of the schools, of the press, of the radio, in order to defog the mass and in order to impose its value system. And so it was in Greece that successive right-wing ministries used exactly those cultural and informational institutions to bombard the Greek public with a frenetic anti-communism. You have to understand what it means to have that kind of reign of propaganda upon the horizon every day. And consequently, the Greeks were told that all of the evils and ills of their society, the physical destruction, the economic stagnation, of the unemployment, that all of those were caused by the communists. And those right-wing ministries struck pay dirt because they 
succeeded more often than not in alienating the peasantry and the uh, petty bourgeoisie who had participated, after all, in the National Liberation Front from any incipient regrouping of the left that might take place, especially among uh, the urban proletariat. But you see, in 1976, uh, we know perfectly well when we look, for example, for some sign, when we listen for some word that the American aggression in Vietnam has played some part in the public consciousness, when we listen for that in the electoral year of 1976, then we realize that propaganda is not only active and noisy, but that it is passive and silent. And so it was that the Greek right passed the resistance movement into the dustbin of history, that it quelled any discussion of the resistance movement, that it treated it with silence, that there was little in the textbooks in schools about it, that teachers did not discuss it, that there was not a single monument in Greece to the martyrs of the resistance against Nazi occupation, and that until 1964, when the centrists were in power, revivified now, and with a certain mass base, which we'll explain momentarily, until 1964, there was not even a day set aside in Greece to celebrate the liberation of Athens from the Nazis. And so you see it is a page out of Orwell, and resistance fighters become non-people. And I would prefer if the baby would cry that you leave with the baby. Because it's very hard to concentrate with the baby crying. And I have no objections. I would the baby the baby crying. Why should they be subjected to me? <laughs> So that an entire generation of young Greeks grew up literally knowing not only very little about their history, but interpreting their recent past simply in terms of the potentiality or the probability of the imposition of a communist tyranny. Now, you must never underestimate the staying power of communist parties. I am constantly amazed by it myself. Constantly amazed, for example, that after long decades of repression, of having been outlawed, of having been pursued, of having been clobbered in every possible way, that at the propitious moment, a communist party sub uh, surfaces in a society and consequently has its apparatus already intact. We saw it in Portugal. Portugal. After 40 years of the Salazar regime, suddenly the Portuguese Communist Party surfaces. We see it in Spain, where after 35 years of terrific Franco repression, there is once again the surfacing of a Communist Party that plays an extremely important role. It's a lesson, you see, that you learn out of the history of this modern and contemporary period that is much, or in whichever ways, that you attack, let us say, the ideology or the strategy or the tactics of communist parties, you can never fault them for going away. And I learned that lesson magnificently over again from an old Spanish militant whom I know in Paris, a man in his 60s now, who when I first met him some three years ago, told me the astonishing fact, how do you absorb it in your sensitivity, that he had been in Franco prisons 33 years that he had been a young anarchist who had been caught by the Franco police and put into prison. And I said, and now what? Now what? And he said, now I am a communist. I said, a communist? You are a Spanish anarchist and you go to communist. It is a transition I don't understand. And he said, look, you are 33 years in Franco prisons and you survive. 
and you learn about the politics on the outside, and you have newspapers that are clandestine newspapers, and you manage even to survive all of the brutality of the prison regime. Why? Because the communists have organized even the prisons, and half the guards are communists, and they give you papers. And he said, if you are going to fight something like Franco, anarchism is beautiful, but communism remains. And consequently, there was something in that lesson that tells us about this strange staying power, so that it doesn't much surprise us that though the Greek Communist Party was forced into exile, that it surfaced through the militants that remained in Greece. That militants who remained in the underground in Greece surfaced by 1951, and they tried to mute their colors as best they could, and to make an alliance with other progressive groups in Greece, and they launched in August of 51 a left-wing but very steadfastly reformist party called EDA, E-D-A, which stood for the Unified Greek Left. And I tell you that for a minute, in the elections of 1958, this EDA, this unified Greek left, as it called itself, really sent tremors of shock through the Greek right and its American patrons, because in those elections it scored well. You see, by 1958, all of the contradictions in Greek society were glaringly plain. We're talking about a social formation that is essentially neo-colonial, which means that tremendous contrast between the impoverishment of the masses and the profiteering of foreign investors and of a lumpen bourgeoisie, which means enclaves of consumerism in a desert of underdevelopment, which means the burgeoning of a tertiary sector of the economy in which a growing number of white-color, petty bourgeois employees are being put to non-productive and parasitical work. At the same time, the repressive machinery of the government is forcing a growing number of workers and of professionals and of white-color employees into active opposition. An opposition that the center, the liberals, because of their division and because of their complicity in the regime, really can't accommodate. So that in 1958, for a moment, it was the moment for Edda for this party of the left ten years after of the Communist Party uh, had been banned. And despite the fact that Greek elections were notoriously rigged, uh, despite the fact that fraud and intimidation were standbys in the electoral procedure of right-wing governments, Edda scored 27% of the vote in 1958 and sent 79 deputies into the Greek parliament. All of which, of course, did not create concessions by the right and by the American embassy in Athens, but rather a stepped up repression and a more sophisticated manipulation. And the Karamanlis government, which was the reigning government of the time, began to reactivate some of the worst of Metoxis laws. Of that law of 1936, for example, of which defined treason against the state in the vaguest possible terms and sent those accused of treason before courts martial where they could be sentenced to death. And that was now re-invoked and it was imposed in a trial against Manilus Lazos, that hero of the Acropolis in May of 1941, the one who had torn down the swastika, but who was the most spirited leader of Edda. And under that law of Metoxis of 1936, Glazos, sent off by this repressive regime to a long prison sentence, and more than that, came those next elections in 1961 in October, and the right was not going to be outflanked by the left 
These were the most controlled elections uh, since that phony plebiscite bringing back the king in the September of 1946. Ballot boxes were stuffed. Greeks were voting who had been long since dead. And consequently, in elections of that kind, the right, of course, won. Nor did the American embassy stay out of it. The American embassy was omnipresent. And when it saw in 1961 and 62 that the effects of those October elections were so scandalous that they were beginning to catalyze a real political opposition in the country, American policymakers intervened openly, directly, as though Greece had no sovereignty. And so on Christmas Day, of 1961, it's the American ambassador in Athens, Walter Briggs, who addresses an open letter to the Greek people congratulating them on having gone to the polls in October of 61 and have proved their dedication to what he called the democratic way of life. And then in August of 1962, yes, came the vice president, Lyndon, armed, of course, with ballpoints, and arrived in Athens, and there showed his open affection for the repressive government of Karamakis and openly promised to step up military shipments. All of which takes us to the heart of the question. Because, you see, in analyzing the repressive parliamentary structure, in saying that there was a counter-revolution that was working inside a constitutional order, in saying that we have only cracked the shell of the problem, because fundamentally, the ruling class of Greece operated inside and uh, uh, manifested its power through a constitutional order only because it could depend upon the staying power of the right. And the right, the political right, could depend upon staying only because it had the support of those critically important extra-parliamentary institutions in Greece which really ruled the country. And we are talking, of course, about the monarchy, but not so much the monarchy, much more the Greek army, and behind it, the American embassy in Athens. Now, let's not be silly that in any underdeveloped country that falls into the web of American imperialism, the locus of power is Washington, and with it, the armies, indigenous armies, that it subsidizes and that it equips. And so it was in Greece that a power constitutional structure existed behind the facade of constitutionalism that intervened whenever it was necessary in order to buttress the right and to safeguard the profitability of neocolonialism and that stood ready at any moment to scrap the whole constitutional structure and consequently to intervene against it whenever the right should prove too weak, whenever it should be outvoted, whenever the popular masses should begin to work their way through that net of repression. The monarchy, yes, the least important element in that block of power, but for 20 years important nonetheless, and which did its counter-revolutionary work you are talking, after all, about the House of Glücksburg that was going to support right-wing ministries without exception and that was going to prove its merit to Churchill and his successor imperialists for the confidence that they had bestowed upon these Danish carpetbaggers. And yet, from the restoration of the monarchy, in September of 1946, when King George II finally came back, until April of 1967, when the military junta very summarily dismisses the monarchy as an anachronism, as a luxury in the block of power, 
that monarchy had no real meaning except a counter-revolutionary one. And the explanation of that is perfectly clear. It is self-interest that the monarchy has no roots, that it is a foreign monarchy and that it doesn't have a feudal tradition in Greece. And consequently, it has been ousted without any loss to the political process for a 10-year period between 24 and 35, and again in the exile during the war. And so, uh, for the House of Luxburg, uh, there is a problem of security. And that problem of security is resolved by a constant support of the politicians and the parties of the right, which are dedicated to the core, to the monarchy, because they consider it the fulcrum and the rallying point for conservatism. But it is something more than that. It is that the ruling house of Greece recognized rather lucidly what its raison d'etre was within the Greek power structure. It understood that its only reason for existence was as the protector of the Greek ruling class. That after all, it had to protect a capitalist elite which resented and resisted any effort to reform either the fiscal or the social structure that was so hostile to the whole notion of yielding up its profits and its gains and privileges that it was always suspicious of parliament. And so the role of the king was to serve as a cushion between a parliament which might reform and a ruling class which refused to yield. And they played that role over and again and most effectively in July of 1965. Because in July of 1965 comes the so-called bloodless coup of King Constantine. That the year before, in 1964, in the elections of the 16th of February, that the centrists, and now supported by popular mobilization, had won at the elections. It's the one breach in this right-wing structure. That the centrists went back with 171 seats against 107 for the right. And the counter-revolution was in danger. And Papandreou became the prime minister, now catering to the popular classes that were rallying behind him and beginning to talk about long overdue social and fiscal reforms. No! It could not be. The king intervened against the Constitution in July of 1965, against the popular will, and simply sacked Papandreou, brought in a conservative Stephanopoulos, and consequently, for the moment, stymied the tide of the popular classes. And yet you see, within two years, that military junta had come to power in 1967 and not only paralyzed the popular classes, but ousted the monarchy. Because you see, and here you get closer to the center, because you see that the real king of the power structure in Greece wasn't the last of the great days, but it was the army. <coughs> And with the army, now listen, what, where is, what is all that that I'm hearing? I'm sorry? Uh, I mean, you know, I'll tell you, listen, 20 years ago, I could have stood anything, including bats in my hair, but I'm getting to be a ragged old bag, and I'm getting nervous about these things. I don't like sounds like that. Uh, and uh, because, you know, my head is is beginning to roll off my shoulders in here. <laughs> so, okay, where do we go? Because I used to teach, you know, I used to teach out in agriculture hall auditorium for years until they, they wrecked that beautiful auditorium and took it away. And, uh, and we always had this bat problem. I mean, bats would come in and so forth. I don't know <laughs> very much and so forth. But I got a method. I mean, I... Charm bats, but I can't. You know, bats would just circle and stop and listen. And, 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 
it's sensitive and, and babies, you know, they shouldn't be, as I say, they shouldn't be subjected to that, they should be uh, out of mixing. <laughs> Learning anti-materialism by crafts. <laughs> Um, are we all right there? Because I don't want to have to stop again. No, oh, okay. Uh, I, you know, I don't mind. I don't mind it, but okay. Let's see. Where was I? <laughs> I don't have I don't have cards to lose my place in but my head. <laughs> uh, you've got to understand what that Greek army was or what the army is in any third world society, which is not terribly populous. You're dealing after all with simply an overwhelming force. Consider that the Greek army in 1967, on the eve of the military coup of the junta, in a population of that hovered around 10 million, stood at 200,000 strong. You're talking about 160,000 troops, about 30,000 reserves, about 10,000 officers, but more than that. Consider that that army usurps 20% of the Greek budget in order to maintain it and to run it. And that American military missions, concerned of course about building up every NATO base, have been giving all kinds of special instructions to Greek officers in order to train them in the most sophisticated tactics of modern warfare and to provide them with the weapons in order to carry that warfare on. Consider what it means even to think of a popular uprising in Greece, in a country in which the army was supplied with a whole division of Patton M47 tanks, in which it had a veritable armory of ground-to-ground -ground missiles. But the thing is that you see the material strength of an army in an underdeveloped country by itself is not the awesome fact. We know perfectly well from the example of Portugal, let us say, that it is possible for progressive and modernizing elements to emerge out of the army. What was awesome and frightening in Greece is the fusion of that material power and a reactionary, anti-communist, frenetically fascistic ideology. That you are talking about an army which had been systematically purged an army which had been cleansed and purified. You're talking about an army which, after the uprising of April of 1944, had been gone through with a fine tooth comb. An army in which the key officers had their training, not in the territorial war against the Nazis, those had been eliminated from the army, but in the struggle against communism in the civil war. And that General Papagos, who was head of the army staff between 1949 and 52, systematically promoted those junior officers who had been most avid in the hunting down of communist bands in the hills. The point is that the Greek army was drenched with an anti-communism that was perfectly unmeasured and uncount, and that it had within it a kind of cancerous cell, a secret organization which grew in December of 1944 called IDEA, I-D-E-A, which was an organization of the extreme right to purge Republicans or reformists or progressives from the officer corps, but more than that, to stand ready at any minute to destroy the constitutional structure of Greece if the ruling class and its interests should be in any way threatened. And all of that, if you want it in brilliant and beautiful form, you get in that great novel of Basilikos called Z, out of which Costa Gavras made his movie, because Basilikos points out 
how all of these officers were not only crypto-fascists, but how in the early 60s especially, when a popular mobilization was taking place, they were dealing with all of those right-wing groups of pro nazi commandos who really were ready uh, to overthrow the constitutional order. Uh, did the army intervene? Until 1958, when right-wing governments were firmly in control, the army stood alert but stationary. Then came 1958 and the threat of EDA, and IDEA begins to activate itself. And consequently, you begin to get that plan Pericles elaborated, which was a plan to really clamp down upon Greek society in case the uh, Greece should be invoked into an anti-Soviet war by the United States. A plan to lock up and to uh, circumscribe communists and all of their sympathizers. Come the elections of 1961, and they are crucially important. The right must steal them, and the army intervenes and helps. You are up in the north of Greece, 1,300 kilometers, which are called the frontier zone, because the guerrillas had operated there. They are under army surveillance. 13 electoral districts are carved out of them. The army prevents centrist candidates from speaking there. In on a large scale. The vote for the radical union, the right-wing party, in the country 50%, in those frontier zones under the army 99%. And so it is there to intervene when necessary. But let's not play games. Let's really get down to the heart. Because fundamentally, if you want to understand the mechanism of imperialism, understand who pays for it. It was the United States that paid for that army. They were American economic advisors who stood at the elbow of those ministers of economic coordination in successive governments to program the irrational economic growth of that neo-colonial society. It was Washington that paid and Washington that bought. It was Washington that could give aid to the tune of four billion dollars between 1947 and 64, an astronomical sum in an otherwise impoverished country, it could take it away, and consequently it had leverage, and how did it use it? Always in favor of the extreme right. From 1947, from the Truman Doctrine on, that American embassy in Athens, intervening so directly, always supporting right-wing governments, the government of Papados between 52 and 55, and even more, the police state of Karaman Lis in those eight years between 55 and 63. Oh yes. American diplomacy sometimes gets very sophisticated. And policymakers can support liberals, and they can even support social democrats when they find out that Mario Soares in Portugal or Helmut Schmidt in Germany is probably a better barrier against an authentic revolution than somebody of the right. But they don't like it. There is something in the grain that is paranoid about all of those reformers. And consequently, they prefer the sure thing. You know, there is a marvelous correspondent in South America for the French newspaper Le Monde named Martin Nitergan. And some years ago, about a half dozen years ago, he interviewed some people in the American embassy in Paraguay, that miserable country uh, where so many are illiterate, where so few own the land, and where you have this bloody dictatorship of Stresner. And he interviews the, somebody in the American embassy, and he asks him, why is it that American diplomacy, after all, supports that reactionary regime. And Dietrichon published the answer which I clipped in the lawn those years ago, and it went this way, it is perfect. In the final analysis, our policy is one of survival. 
thus assure anti-communism, uh, anti-communist, no matter how despicable, is better than a reformer, no matter how honest, who might turn against us. You see, in those terms, the Greek center didn't have a chance. The center that claimed its paternity from Venezuelos. Now, we know perfectly well that the center didn't offer really an alternative to the left, any more than Carter offers one to Ford. Except, of course, that Carter is a little bit more ambitious about liberating Latvia and Estonia tomorrow morning. But it's <laughs> <laughs> that for the most part, the center had comes out of exactly of the same kind of bourgeois tradition, is as much concerned about the communist menace, as much partisan of the American presence, but with all of those billions poured into Greece, with the Greek per capita income in 1952 being only $135, with the potential of upset, American policymakers preferred the sure thing. And so, for example, they intervene so directly, you know it is really embarrassing. A country is a country. I don't give much for sovereignty, but it's there, and you shouldn't go intervening so openly and obviously and running things. But these ambassadors in that early period, in the 50s especially, simply didn't care. And so you got, for example, these elections of 1952, and the Americans had found their man, General Papagos, the chief of staff of the Greek army. And so they decided that the Greek rally, which was the party of Papagos, had to win. But the centrists were making noise, and we had an ambassador in Greece at that time, a real, a, a frenzied type, a name John Purifoy. I break it because he's influential in other places. And John Purifoy looks at this and says the center cannot really win these elections, intervenes openly. Two public statements in which he says bluntly that Washington, which pays the bills, won the election of General Papagos. Now you see for John Purifoy, who really was a madman about this kind of intervention, Greece was just a kind of a trial run because he's the guy who shows up in 1953 and 54 in Guatemala. And he gets to Guatemala just at the moment that there is a mild reformist effort by Arbenz Gutzmann, an effort to give some land to those benighted peasant Indian masses of Guatemala. And so by the time Purifoy got there, Arbenz had proposed the expropriation with compensation of 228,000 acres of uh, unused land in the ownership of that huge octopus United Fruit, and said he would pay for it, or the Guatemalans would pay for it, but they chose to pay for it at the land value that United Fruit had proclaimed for tax purposes, which infuriated United Fruit, infuriated the State Department, and which caused, of course, John Purifoy to have a very severe case of Forrest Hall's disease. And consequently, he decided that Arbenz was a communist, and if he wasn't a communist, he would have to do until a better one came along. He literally writes or wires to the State Department in December of 1953, Arbenz thinks like a communist, talks and walks like a communist, and if he isn't actually a communist, he'll have to do until a real one comes along. <laughs> The result being, of course, uh, that the State Department gave complete green light to Purifoy to mix with the CIA in one of its first very successful actions to pick a group of Guatemalan officers, to train them, to arm them, to make their strategy, and consequently to lead them into that coup of June of 1954, which overthrew our beds and which extinguished the light from that time until this for those Indian masses of Guatemala. So that the problem for the United States, for American policy makers, and for all of the rest of the Greek power bloc was simply the problem of finding a reliable right-wing government. And they lucked out in 1952 with the accession of the so-called Greek rally, the party of General Papagos. And that right-wing government was in office and the mainstay behind it, the American embassy, between October of 1952 and October of 1955. In that ministry, the strong man was the Minister of Economic Coordination named Spiros Marcosinus. Now, I interviewed Marcosinus about, what, 
12 years ago in Greece. He's a very strange man, and obviously a very opportunistic kind of right-wing guy. He's also extremely short, which is no problem, <coughs> except that he's very conscious of it, and consequently he sits you in this very lavish apartment, down on some kind of very low ottoman. <laughs> well, no, I shouldn't say that in Greece, should I? <laughs> sit you on a kind of footstool and so forth, and then himself stands for long interviews and consequently sort of towers over. Suffice it to say, at any rate, that Marcus Zenas was uh, the funnel uh, through which American investment really began uh, to pour into Greece at very profitable times. Because as Minister of Economic Coordination, uh, he put through that law of the 24th of October of 1953, uh, by which law um, uh, foreign investments were protected uh, by very favorable terms. Uh, that capital could be uh, uh, repatriated uh, to the home country uh, of the foreign investor. In other words, there was no provision uh, for maintaining the capital in Greece uh, that was taken as profit. But more than that, uh, the law of 53 uh, provided that there would be uh, no nationalization. It guaranteed against nationalization. And under that law, uh, within the next 10 years, uh, between 53 and 63, uh, about 350 contracts uh, were signed uh, between the Greek government and foreign investors, uh, half the capital invested under those terms uh, coming from uh, the United States. Uh, so that you begin to get a uh, Dow Chemical, you begin to get Reynolds Metal, and you begin to get uh, Esso Papas, uh, Standard Oil of New Jersey, uh, operating uh, inside this Greek market. Uh, Papagos himself uh, favored uh, the Americans in another way uh, because he struck uh, the agreement enabling the United States, the agreement of the 12th of October of 53, enabling the United States uh, to build military bases in Greece and to use Greek railroads and Greek roads in order to uh, make their own troop movements and also to uh, simply quarter their troops in Greece uh, with extraterritorial uh, privileges. Uh, but Papagos couldn't last forever. He died of a heart attack in October of 1955, but the Americans locked out, or those who were concerned about this neo-colonial structure, because the Papagos government replaced by the regime of Karamanlis. And the regime of Karamanlis is really critical to your understanding of this whole story. And it is under, uh, uh, critical to your understanding, certainly, of the film Z uh, and of the entire structure of repression in 1963. Because Karaman Lis came on and really imposed an eight-year uh, police state uh, from 1955 uh, to 1963. A great favorite of the United States. The American embassy loved Karamadlis. I was in Greece often in those years. And I used to go to the embassy just for glandular purposes, I think, uh, to talk to the political officer and find out what they were thinking. Uh, which didn't take very long. But suffice it to say, anyway, uh, that they loved Carmen Lees, and why not? Carmen Lees was the only prime minister in Western Europe who sent Kennedy a telegram of congratulations after the Bay of Pigs. <laughs> <laughs> pro-American and frenetically anti-communist to do that. The thing about it is that what he does is to really create a police apparatus which is ubiquitous. It's the Greece that I really got to know perfectly well. You get, for example, the so-called TEA. Uh, the TEA, uh, which were these provincial police, paramilitary police units uh, in order to survey and to constantly guard uh, the villages against any infection. And then you get, of course, the KYP, uh, which is the Greek variant of the CIA, uh, trained by the CIA, which began to be ubiquitous too. Security police really were everywhere. I'll tell you an interesting story. Uh, in, it was in 63, it was actually at the time, of, right after the, the assassination of Gregory Lambrakis, about which the novel Z and the movie Z uh, is the center. 
as the uh, Lambrakis was an Eda deputy uh, who was assassinated in Salonika uh, and uh, consequently uh, was assassinated by a right wing group with the complicity of the army and the complicity of state services uh, and of course there was a tremendous uproar. Lambrakis was a magnificent guy, uh, certainly the brightest man in Eda, uh, was a professor of medicine, a uh, distinguished doctor uh, and his assassination roused that tremendous, tremendous uh, funeral procession of 400,000 in that little country and consequently forced the resignation finally of Karaman Lis. Well, I was there right in that uh, uh, period and uh, I had an interview to see a guy named uh, Ilya Ilyu, uh, who was the parliamentary leader of EDA. Uh, and uh, uh, I had it through a journalist in Afti, which was the newspaper of that party. And the guy came and got me at an appointed cafe uh, near Constitution Square, uh, and uh, then he took me in a car. And, you know, it was a very circuitous route. I didn't know where I was going, and it went, seemed to go all over Athens. Uh, and finally, we got into some sort of back alley, uh, and there was this kind of warehouse-looking thing. Uh, and uh, I got out and uh, went, went up in what was surely a freight elevator at that point, uh, and uh, went through some corridors with a lot of mimeograph stuff and so forth. These turned out to be EDA headquarters, uh, and a lot of mimeograph material. And we were taken all the way to a back office, and there was Ilyu, uh, who was, uh, had, was a lawyer by training, uh, didn't speak any English, spoke very proper French, looked very much like a bourgeois lawyer, had a double-breasted suit and all that. Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, I always started out these things by saying, well, you know, what, what's doing in Greece? Uh, or how is it? Or something of that sort, and see where it will go. And he said, well, look, he said, you want to know what kind of a country Greece is? You want to know what kind of a country the Truman Doctrine made? Hmm? I said, yes. He said, who knows that you came to see me today? I said, just you and me and Janos Rigos, who, who brought me here. He said, at this moment, the police know that an American professor is visiting the parliamentary leader of EDA. <coughs> He said, I want you to recognize that because that's the kind of country you're in. And it is that, for the Greeks, it is that certainly, even after I have no time to talk about that magnificent effort of 1963-5, finally really to break through that structure of repression, the king frustrated it in 65, the military frustrated it in 67. The power of bloc, you see, remains very strong. It is the embassy in Athens, it is the Greek army, and it has brought back Karamanlis again within the framework of this kind of truncated parliamentary structure, this kind of pseudo-constitutionalism, because the junta, the colonels, simply couldn't swing any kind of popular support in order to maintain their particular regime. All of that, all of that, is at least some kind of footnote in any paper that you write in your head about what it is to be caught in the web of American imperialism and what happens to those societies. Now think of that. We've elaborated the Greeks simply because that's where the Truman Doctrine directed all of that rhetoric and all of those efforts. And how really do we stand it, all of that hypocrisy, when so many people suffer as a result of these interventions, and all of them praised and celebrated as victories? You've got to think about how you cope with that, because it's not just something to write down. You've really got to cope with that.